words that I've given in the spelling bee, I love sardoodledom. <laughs> I think it's just a fun word. It's a blessing to me when I can get up and just be able to put a meal in the microwave. My main concern was how is, how is this going to affect my getting my daughter back? That is paramount. I started smoking pot when I was about 18. I was 19 when I met my husband. He kind of introduced me to oxycodone. I got in two car accidents back to back and I went to a doctor. You have doctors that are called pain doctors. They go from prescribing nothing to prescribing a very powerful opioid that turns into this beast you can't control. A lot of people turn to heroin because it is significantly cheaper. When you find something you like in that drug culture, you kind of stick with it. Okay, okay. do we have any aluminum foil? John and I have been together now 10 years. He was my knight in shining armor, and then we slowly fell into addiction. Yes, dear. We split up for about four or five months when I went into rehab. I could feel a piece of me missing, but I was so broken outside of our relationship. There's absolutely no way he and I would have been good together. In order for us to be the best version of ourselves, we had to worry about ourselves for a minute. That'll do. After him graduating rehab and being there for the same amount of time, it allowed us to come back together as the people we were when we first met. Not for some more, I'll tell you one. We're involved in family court, and my daughter is with my mom. She has been taken out of my husband and my custody for the time being. We're building slowly towards her coming and living with us. My focus is being the best father, the best provider, the best person I can be. And there's nothing that I wouldn't do for her. We're still left with all the problems and the debt that we had incurred before we went into rehab. And then starting off trying to find um, a place to live, getting all the essentials, a bed, Finding balance when it's mm -hmm. so tilted. Yeah. You're still weighed down by your past, and here you are trying to balance everything out just because of the wreckage. It's impossible. Yeah, it's just, it's really hard to find that balance right now. But we manage. Mm -hmm. I used to tell him all the time, I, I'd, I'd ask him to tell me a story, just like that, I'd be like, tell me a story. And I'd sit there and I'd listen to him tell me Jen a story. Jen has made this entire process movies. bearable. <laughs> she has answered my phone calls whenever I've needed her, whether she's in a meeting herself, if she's with her family, she'll step outside. She has been a constant in this flux. She's kind of helped me stay grounded, and if I needed advice, she's been there. She's an amazing person, that Jen. So how was Christmas? Christmas, Christmas was difficult, not gonna lie. My, uh, my mom at the last minute decided that she wasn't comfortable having John and I there because my sister and all of them haven't, haven't quite 
gotten to the point where they want to be around us. You know, just because you guys are healing and your healing process and you're feeling good doesn't mean that they've let go yet. You know, and it's on them. And that's, I think, the hardest part is I'm so eager to get back in touch with my family. A lot of people want to heal those relationships and they don't really grasp that, that the other side isn't necessarily ready to heal or willing to heal right away. You can't force somebody to see you change. Part of letting go is letting go of your family to allow them to heal too. As hurtful as it can be, that's why we say build a support network because other people have done this too. That's why we see them three times a week to work on how they feel and how difficult it is. Part of, part of getting sober is, is making a new family, sort of. At least you guys have each other, mm -hmm. which is great because there's a lot of people alone, but you guys have each other, you know, and if you have positive people to spend, you know, holidays and stuff right. with, you know, that really helps. Instead of sending my daughter to foster care or um, a foster home, my mom offered to take temporary custody of her so I could focus on myself and so John could focus on himself. She has been with my mom since I entered rehab, so it's, it's going on almost 11 months that I haven't been around her. Hey, you want your goldfish, huh? I think my mom is uncomfortable with me having my daughter for a lot of reasons. I haven't been the most present mother. My mom has been her caregiver for almost her entire life because I was there but not there. I was using, I was, I was getting high. I think my mom's extremely uncomfortable. She's not quite sure of my resolve. Addiction is not just about the addict. It's it affects the whole family, and it has caused my mom to be very distrustful of not only me, but of my actions. Okay, let's go find Daddy. I can't force it. I cannot pressure her. It's, it'll end up causing more harm than good. My intentions for this scenario, as far as staying clean, having my daughter, having a relationship with my mom, having John have a relationship with my family, and having that family unit be whole. That's what I want out of all of this. I have court for the shoplifting. The incident. The incident. In rehab, I fell into a group of girls who was stealing from different stores. I ended up taking quite a few articles of clothing from Target, and they got me for shoplifting. I made a really bad decision, and I'm human. I know what's going to happen, but it was just... You're in rehab, so it's like a bunch of... I mean, in rehab, nobody... You're all there together, so no decision-making process has been positive so far right. <laughs> to meet people in treatment. It's really common when, when you stop doing something you're used to doing all the time and you're looking for things to fill the void. Without drugs, you, you look for some kind of excitement. And right. Sadly, breaking the law is exciting because you're kind of used to doing that in a sense. You know, it's. It's kind of sad, but it's kind of true at the same time. Mm -hmm. So is it uncommon that somebody would go out and do something like that, you know, with three, four weeks clean and sober? No, actually it's not. Mm -hmm. My main concern was how is, how is this going to affect my getting my daughter back? That is paramount. Anything and everything to do with her is paramount in this situation, and I'm, I'm terrified terrified. My greatest fear is going on probation and losing my job and then in turn having this family court process drag out even longer. That means more time without my daughter and that means falling back into a depression that means a greater chance of relapse and that's not something I'm willing to allow to happen. Shell and Zelda.
Justice Paulson now presiding. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. You may be seated. The first case being called is Allison Nicole Norland. Good afternoon, Judge. I try to look at things with um, a lot of light, a lot of uh, what draws me to is po positivity. This is the first time in the country that a state has invested in a program like this. So they're investing in Project Angel Food and five other organizations across the state that provide medically tailored meals. And they're targeting people with congestive heart failure because they use the healthcare system the most. So there's going to be a thousand clients over three years. We're going to look at them a year before they got the food, while they got the food, and a year after they got the food to see how they did, how their life changed, how long they stayed out of the hospital. Hi, Marjorie. Hello. Oh, my God. Hello, goodies. Oh, this is Tom says hello for you. If we keep someone out of the hospital for one day, it saves $5,000. And $5,000 will pay for this whole program for three months, providing them three meals a day, three months, and the nutrition counseling they need. This one is barbecue shredded pork. I am part of Project Angel Food, and I do receive my meals. They come um, every Monday, and I receive seven meals, which is one meal per day. It's a blessing to me when I can get up and just be able to put a meal in the microwave. And it goes according to our diet. It's whatever our doctors put us on. There is science behind what we do, and it's the registered dietitians who provide that science. They go through all of the different guidelines from the different associations, the Diabetic Association, the Heart Association, and look at what the requirements are, and then we build meals that fulfill those requirements. Even though we still get weak and out of breath and all those things, but the point is, I do have a nutritional meal coming in to where, yes, it, it helps you. I try to look at things with um, a lot of light, a lot of uh, what draws me to is po positivity, something that means love or, or happiness. I could say something with my pictures about my cancer journey with, with just like one picture. It helps me take my mind off of it, a distraction to think of something else other than cancer, 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 chemo. I was diagnosed when I was 11, and it's a, it's a muscle tumor. She's relapsed twice. Um, they both have been really, really hard to deal with. Pablo, it's like that one positive thing in her that she's always looking forward to. We invest in underfunded, cutting-edge uh, pediatric cancer research. We improve the lives of children and teens living with cancer through the arts. Makes me feel excited. A little bit of nervous, you know, putting your art out there and, you know, trying, seeing what people have to say about it. Dad. Pablo Shutterbugs serves as a distraction for these students um, while they're going through their treatment because it literally is an out-of-hospital experience. We provide all of the cameras free of charge to our students and it's something that they can literally take with them anywhere. 
being in these classes with other people that completely understand their experience and can be a community with them um, has been really impactful and has really made them feel a lot more comfortable in what they've been through and, and where they're going with it. So to date, we have served about 1,300 students across the country. We encourage them to use the camera and use what they learn to tell their cancer experience and to share that with the world. We do sell our student prints, and so um, with each print that we sell, all of the proceeds go into funding our research grants. Hello, my name is Bayou Lookman, and I have some photos in this gallery. Most of my photos themes focused on hope. Hope is, I'd say, decently important as it's a strong motivation just keep on living through what i what you've been through in a way because when you have cancer and you're like super young you don't know what's really going on and then when you realize it you don't you kind of get really depressed and you don't want to live anymore you need to stay you know optimistic and push yourself through problem helped me understand more about the struggles of cancer and has given me a small chance to actually assist in the world a bit with photography, I'd say, to express my story and allow it to hopefully reach other kids so they can understand how to deal with it, hopefully. I think with photography and having that faith of God has really helped me a lot into, you know, staying positive and being motivated to want to keep fighting this disease. Art and music. Mm -hmm. What fine passion can I have? It's been my entire life. So words that I've given in the spelling bee, I love sardoodledom. I think it's just a fun word. It's a useful word. And the speller who got it was Kenyi Awad, and he thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever heard, and he couldn't stop giggling. And I had to sort of reel him in and you know bring him down to get him to spell the word. It was it was that was a neat moment. <laughs> it may sound like a joke, but I usually say I get a front row seat at the best event in the world. My name is Jacques Bailey. I am the official pronouncer for the Scripps National Spelling Bee. As a child, I had a total fascination with language. I was trying to learn French all my life. I still am. Uh, the spelling bee sort of fed into that in sixth grade and Latin in high school. I, so I sort of drifted throughout my life. Just one thing would keep interesting me and um, languages kept my interest uh, all the way up till now. I didn't win any spelling bees in sixth and seventh grade, so I was really hungry and really wanted to, to win. And in eighth grade, that was when I uh, won each spelling bee I was in until I won the big national spelling bee. In the national spelling bee, my final word was elucubrate. I became involved with the national spelling bee because I wrote to them and I said, I don't know if you remember me, but I won the spelling bee 10 years ago. And since then I've learned Latin and Greek and German and a lot more French. And I think I have a skill set you might need for something or other. And it just so happened that they did need somebody to be associate pronouncer, which is, at that point, was basically a chief fact checker at the B. I had a hidden mission because I thought they were using words that were too hard. I thought that we don't need words that nobody's ever heard of to get a champion. And at that point, believe it or not, we didn't. But now they study so hard that we need the impossible words. Most of us in our daily life might misspell accommodate. These kids are at an age where their memory is amazing and they have time to devote to this and they love it. But we need to find words like Ursprache because they've studied so much that you've got to look for the nooks and crannies. So these kids have a, a very deep knowledge and deep intuition, a, a, a Sprachgefühl, a feeling for the language that is uh, much broader and wider and more informed than most adults. People think length matters for these spellers. For most of them, it doesn't. A long word is usually a lot easier. The four-letter words are often the hardest. I have a particular view about human rights. I think the most fundamental one is a right to education. 
and working with the bee enables me to do something that I'm able to do to inspire people to educate themselves. My role is to help the spellers, so it's very much sort of a, an affirmation and a, a role where I, I get inspired by them. So it's, it's more than fun, it's really meaningful. Dunmont High School is a high school for, for professional health careers and it gets you ready for college in the next level. Dunmont is just an amazing school. I had the pleasure of teaching one um, class of 12th graders. Most of these students I taught them, a lot of them anyway, I taught them in the ninth grade. And I had an awesome class that I taught um, in the 12th grade was a medical ethics class and they're very inquisitive, direct, uh, they will question and um, they, they basically want their voices to be heard. That's the type of um, class I would say this um, 2018 class is. Yes. The biggest thing is finding where you belong, whether it be in sports or science or even fashion but really finding out where you fit in. But people tend to give up, and they also have dreams that they believe will just fall in their lap. But from my understanding, you have to earn and take what you want. You can't sit back and allow stuff to come to you. Take what you want. Don't let others give it to you. I'm Leo Sarkeesian. Happy to have you with us today. This example is the South Central Province of the country, and the dance music is from the ethnic group called Betty. What finer passion can I have? It's been my entire life. It's from a childhood right up till today and maybe into the future. I'll still be doing my art and I'll be dancing with my music. Great. What else? <laughs> it is passion. Mm -hmm. 